In his poem of 1820 entitled La Mia, John Keats complained that cold science had destroyed the magic of nature, conquering all mysteries by rule and line, and that Newton, through his work on optics, had unweaved the rainbow. In this video I'd like to show that Keats was misguided, and that by understanding the physics of rainbows, using only the basic tools of geometry and imagination, the experience of seeing a rainbow is enhanced, not diminished, and that the pursuit of scientific knowledge only ever adds to the magic and mystery of reality, it never subtracts. While scientists had been trying to explain the origins of rainbows for at least a millennium, it was Isaac Newton who offered the first truly convincing explanation in his 1704 work, Optics. Newton understood several things all at once, each of which was essential for producing rainbows. First, he demonstrated that normal white light was composed of a whole spectrum of colours, and by refracting light through a glass prism, he was able to separate the light into its component colours. We now know that the colour of light is determined by the wavelength or frequency of the light. The wavelength of a wave is the distance between two adjacent peaks of the wave, whereas the frequency is the number of crests passing a point each second. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, and the more blue the light is. The longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency, and the more red the light is. Different wavelengths or frequencies of light are refracted or bent through slightly different angles as they pass through the prism, which is what causes the different colours to spread out and form a continuous spectrum of colour. Newton also realised that many different materials could also refract light, including water, and this is how he came to understand that raindrops refracting and reflecting light were key to producing a rainbow. It had long been known that in order for someone to observe a rainbow, three conditions are necessary. Firstly, the sun needs to be behind you. Secondly, there must be raindrops in the sky in front of you. This could be miles away or just a few metres away. And thirdly, the sunlight must be able to reach the raindrops without any obstruction, such as clouds. Consider a ray of red light incident upon a spherical droplet, as shown in the diagram. Depending on where the beam strikes the sphere, the angle of incidence alpha varies. We will assume for the moment that the angle of incidence is 45 degrees. We wish to calculate the path of this ray of light as it passes through the water droplet. In order to do this, we will use Snell's law, which relates the angle of incidence alpha and the angle of refraction beta as light passes from one material to another. Refraction is a result of a ray of light being slowed down as it passes from one material into another. For a very crude analogy, think of pushing a shopping trolley from the road onto grass at an angle. It will change direction because the side of the trolley that hits the grass first will be slowed down first. Now as the ray of light passes into water, the frequency and therefore colour remains the same. However, the speed of the ray will change by an amount that depends on the frequency. This is because the atomic structure of water interacts differently with waves of different frequencies. A measure of the slowing down of light with frequency is given by the refractive index labelled N. Its value depends not only on the frequency, but also the medium the light is entering. The refractive index is defined as the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the material under investigation. In our example, we have a ray of red light passing from air into water. The speed of light in air is very close to the speed of light in a vacuum, irrespective of the frequency, and so we can assume that the refractive index of air is roughly equal to 1. On the other hand, red light in water has a refractive index of 1.33. We can sub this information into Snell's law to find that sine of 45 is equal to 1.33 times sine of beta, if we then solve for beta, we find an angle of refraction of 32.12 degrees. And so we can now determine the path of the red ray of light as it moves towards the back of the droplet. What happens when the light hits the boundary at the back? Well, depending on the exact value of the angle beta, some of the light leaves the back of the droplet, but crucially, some of it reflects back towards the front of the droplet. Finally, the ray of light refracts again as it leaves the front of the droplet with the same angle of 45 degrees that it entered with. 
So how would this be different if we had a ray of blue light instead of red light? Well in that case the refractive index would change since the frequency of the light has changed. Instead of 1.33 the refractive index would now be 1.34. Now this might not seem like much of a change but we see that when we plug this into Snell's law it leads to an angle of refraction of 31.85 degrees. And this causes the blue light to take a slightly different path around the droplet compared to the red light. And it is this difference in refraction angle for each of the different colours of light which causes the dispersion of light from each droplet and which ultimately gives rise to the coloured bands of the rainbow in much the same way as when light shines through a prism. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First, let's take a closer look at the geometry of the situation. After a ray of sunlight refracts, reflects and then refracts again on its way out of the raindrop, the ray is pretty much reverse direction. We can calculate how much an incident ray is deviated as a function of the angle at which it hits the droplet. In other words, we can determine the angle through which the ray has been turned clockwise as it is refracted, reflected and then refracted again. This angle is called the angle of deviation and is labelled D of alpha. We can write an expression for the angle of deviation in terms of alpha and beta by noticing that all of the highlighted green angles in the diagram must add up to 360 degrees. And so we can write 2 times 180 minus 2 beta plus 2 alpha plus 180 minus D of alpha equals 360. And then this simplifies to D of alpha equals 180 minus 4 beta plus 2 alpha. What we now want to do is plot a graph to see how the deviation angle varies with the angle of incidence. In order to do this, we will combine our expression for the deviation angle with Snell's law. To simplify the algebra in what follows, we will assume that the refractive index of our ray of red light is exactly 4 thirds, and as before, we will assume that the refractive index of air is 1. Substituting this into Snell's law and rearranging, we find that sine of alpha equals 4 thirds sine beta, and therefore beta equals sine to the minus 1 of 3 quarters sine alpha. If we then substitute this into the expression for the deviation angle, we arrive at the following general equation in terms of only alpha. Having arrived at this general expression, we can now calculate the deviation angle for a variety of different angles of incidence and produce a results table like the one shown. But we want to visualise this data, so let's plot this information on a graph, with alpha on the x-axis and the deviation angle on the y-axis. We see that the plotted graph has a clearly defined minimum at which the deviation angle has its lowest value. We can estimate this value, as well as the corresponding angle of incidence, by reading the values off our graph. We see that a minimum deviation angle of roughly 138 degrees occurs when the angle of incidence is around 59 degrees. We can also see from the graph that the minimum deviation angle occurs when the gradient of the graph is zero. And therefore to find a more accurate value for the minimum deviation angle, we can use some basic calculus and differentiate the deviation angle equation and set it equal to zero. If we do this, we find the following expression which can be simplified and set equal to zero. If we now rearrange this expression and then bring the cosine to the other side and square both sides, we find the following blue equation. Next, we can use the fact that sine squared alpha plus cosine squared alpha equals one to eliminate cosine from our equation. If we sub in this relation and simplify, we finally arrive at the equation sine of alpha equals the square root of 20 over 27. Solving for alpha, we find a value of 59.4 degrees. And if we then sub this into our expression for the deviation angle, we find the minimum value is 138 degrees. And just to remind you what these angles actually represent, alpha refers to the angle of incidence, and the deviation angle is the angle through which the ray is rotated in a clockwise direction as a result of passing through the droplet. Now, what makes this minimum deviation angle significant is not the particular numerical value, but rather the fact that it represents a minimum of a function. To understand the significance of this fact, let's refer back to our graph.
Firstly, notice what happens when we change the angle of incidence from 20 degrees to 40 degrees. In this case, we see that there is a significant change in the deflection angle, roughly 16 degrees. However, if we change the angle from 70 degrees to 50 degrees, then we see that this only corresponds to a shift in deflection angle of 1 degree. In other words, when the angle of incidence is in the region of 59 degrees, then all of the deflected rays tend to bunch together with a very similar deflection angle centred around 138 degrees. This accumulation of rays with a deflection angle of 138 degrees means that the light deflected at this angle is significantly brighter and more intense than at any other angle. And this is what makes this particular angle so significant. The ray entering at the minimum angle alpha in this cross section is shown in red. It is called the rainbow ray. The rays that hit the droplet near the rainbow ray with an angle close to alpha cluster close to it during their passage through the droplet and when they emerge. So if your eye happens to catch the rainbow ray from this particular droplet after it's emerged, you will see a whole bunch of other rays too, making the red light that comes from this droplet particularly intense. So let's pause a moment and take stock of what we've learnt so far. Consider an observer looking towards a collection of water droplets with the sun behind them. Since the sun is roughly 93 million miles away, when rays of light reach the surface of the Earth, we can assume that they are essentially parallel with respect to each other. Let us focus on two such rays of light. One that skims the head of the observer, which we will use as our reference line, and a red ray of light that is incident upon a water droplet with an angle of incidence of roughly 59 degrees. We have just calculated that the angle of deviation of the ray of light passing through the droplet is approximately 138 degrees. If we then calculate the angle made between the deflected ray and the ray that skims the head of the observer, we find an angle of 42 degrees, and this angle is referred to as the rainbow angle. And since 138 degrees was the minimum deflection angle, it follows that 42 degrees is the maximum possible rainbow angle. Now it's important to emphasise that the angle at which the light exits the drop can be anything between 0 and 42 degrees, but never more than 42 degrees. And this maximum angle is different depending on the colour of light. So if you look at an angle of 42 degrees away from the reference line in the diagram, and it doesn't matter whether it is straight up, to the right or to the left, that is where you will see the red band of the rainbow. So what about the other colours in the rainbow? Well, if we repeat this analysis for blue light, then because of the slightly different refractive index of blue light in water, the blue light takes a slightly different path through the droplet, and we find that the maximum rainbow angle for blue light is close to 40 degrees. And so if we put this all together, then we see that at an angle of 42 degrees from the reference line, an observer would see the red band of the rainbow. And at an angle of 40 degrees above the reference line, the same observer would see the blue band of the rainbow. The other colours making up the rainbow, orange, yellow and green, are found between the red and blue bands. Now you might well wonder, at the maximum rainbow angle for blue light, are we seeing only blue light? After all, red light can also emerge at 40 degrees, since its maximum rainbow angle is 42 degrees. The answer to this question is that at the maximum angle for any given colour, that particular colour dominates all others. However, with red light, because its rainbow angle is the highest, it is the only colour at this angle. Now it is worth emphasising that even though you will see blue, red or yellow light from certain raindrops, these raindrops will also reflect and refract light at angles less than 40 degrees. And so the light that you find at angles less than 40 degrees is a mixture of all the different colours at roughly equal intensities, which we will see as white light. And that is why the sky appears bright and white on the inside of a rainbow. At the same time, none of the light that refracts and reflects through the raindrop in the manner that we have discussed can ever leave the droplet at an angle greater than 42 degrees. And so the sky outside the bow is darker than the sky inside the bow. This effect is most noticeable if you compare the brightness of the sky on either side of the rainbow. So what does this look like in reality? Well, here is a photo of a rainbow that we can use to compare our theoretical calculations with observation. If we first focus our attention on the primary rainbow, 
then we notice that the red band is at the top of the rainbow and the blue band at the bottom as expected. Furthermore, we can clearly see the difference in brightness either side of the bow as predicted. But what about the secondary bow that we see in this image? How does that form? And why do the colours in this bow appear in the reverse order when compared to the primary bow? In order to understand the origin of the secondary rainbow, let's consider our idealised raindrop once again. As we have already seen, the primary bow is caused by light which enters a drop and reflects once at the back of the droplet. But is it possible that the light could reflect more than once inside the droplet? Well, as you might have guessed, the answer is yes. The secondary bow is created by those rays of light that reflect twice whilst inside the droplet before refracting on their way out. And just like with the primary rainbow analysis, we can calculate the angle through which the incident ray is deviated as it passes through the droplet. Only this time, the deviation angle is the total amount of counterclockwise rotation that the ray undergoes in this four-stage process. I will leave it as an exercise for you to convince yourself that this is the case, and that the deviation angle can be written as d of alpha equals 2 alpha minus 6 beta plus 360. And just like before, we can find the minimum deviation angle by differentiating this expression and setting it equal to zero. And if we do this, then we find that the angle alpha is given by the following expression, where n is the refractive index. If we once again assume that the refractive index of red light in water is approximately 4 thirds, then we see that the angle alpha can be calculated to be 71.8 degrees and it follows that the counterclockwise deviation angle is therefore 231 degrees. So let us now visualise what this means. If we draw in some dashed reference lines, then things become a bit clearer. If we then label the 231 degree counterclockwise deviation angle, we see that the clockwise deviation angle is 129 degrees, and therefore the rainbow angle for the red band of the secondary rainbow is 51 degrees. So what about the blue light? Well, as mentioned already, because blue light has a different refractive index to red light, it will take a slightly different path through the droplet. And as we see, the red light and blue light emerge in the opposite order compared to the primary rainbow. Furthermore, if we do the calculations, we find the blue light rainbow angle is just under 54 degrees. So let's put all this information together. If we just focus on the red bands momentarily, then our previous analysis tells us that the primary red band should appear at an angle of 42 degrees, and the secondary red band roughly 10 degrees higher at an angle of 51 degrees. If we now add in the other colours, remembering that the colours of the secondary rainbow are reversed, we find the following situation. As already mentioned for the primary rainbow, many rays emerge from water droplets at an angle which is smaller than that of the rainbow angle whereas almost no rays emerge at angles greater than the rainbow angle. This was the reason for the difference in brightness either side of the primary rainbow. In the case of the secondary rainbow, very few rays emerge at angles smaller than the rainbow rays, and therefore a dark region forms between the two rainbows, and this region is referred to as Alexander's band. Furthermore, because the light inside the droplets of the secondary rainbow have taken a longer trip around the droplet, leaking light along the way, we find that less light emerges from these droplets compared to the droplets of the primary rainbow, and so the secondary bow appears less intense than the primary bow in the sky. So let's take one final look at a real rainbow. Only this time when we look at it, we are going to see it as a physicist, and therefore we are going to see the hidden beauty that knowledge brings to our perception of reality. I hope you enjoyed the journey.